I call you Jesus. You're the master of the world. Amen. You may be seated. Second Timothy chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 1. Know this also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. That's part of what Brother Mike was talking about. This rebellion, rebellious youth, the rise in rebellion in the society. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. Trust breakers, covenant breakers. They don't keep their words. False accusers. Incontinent fears. Despisers of those that are good. Traitors. Heady. That's stubborn. High-minded. Lovers of pleasure. More than lovers of God. Sexual gratification is the other day. This is part of the climate of the last days. Let me see if I'm finished. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such, stay away. So, a lot of them go to church, oh, but if you look at the life-changing power of Christianity, it's not in their lives. Some of them are preachers. It's when you look into their life, you see this is the climate that will be on the earth when the Lord returns. Yet, at that same time, there will be another climate of those that are sold out to God on fire burning. Which side do you want to be in? Now watch. Having a form of godliness, that's verse 5. But denying the power thereof for such turn away. For of this sort, so this kind of people, a day which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sin, led away with divers lust. Obviously, when the husband is not around, they come behind. And the Bible calls them foolish, silly women loaded with lust. They will come there and help them and find justification for it from the Bible. So you now have escalation in immorality. Even married people. Then verse 7. Ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. You're always teaching them, teaching them. You think they come, they come to know. Ooh. They want new revelations. That's what they're interested in. But doing it. Now, as Janice and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. They resist the truth. And they also sometimes resist leaders that are bringing down moral influence. Maybe if you want to correct them and all that. They resist. They resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faiths. So there are people in the faith, but are reprobate. Scripture spoke about this in another place where he said that before the coming of the Lord, there will be a great falling away. Reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further. For their foolishness or their foolish shall be made manifest to all men, even as theirs. That is Janus and Jambres. But you have fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, my purpose, my faith, my long suffering, and charity, and patience, and persecutions, and afflictions, which came to me at Antioch. Yes, verse 12. Yeah, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But evil men, look at verse 13, evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is the last days. Do 
Did you notice everything listed there? That there is one word that summarizes it. Sin. Sin. I think I need to read something. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's read about the coming of the man of sin. He's called the man of sin, Antichrist. So this new world order is about promoting evil, unrighteousness. Everything that the Bible condemns is what they're promoting. You heard Brother Mike today. Now we beseech you, verse 1, by the coming of brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together to him. So he's talking about the end time and the return of Christ. And he starts talking about this man of righteousness. He said in verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. Then, he now goes to verse 7. He said, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now let it will let until he is taken out of the way. So there is a work of the Holy Spirit on the earth that is restraining this thing from coming into full climax. And very soon it's going to come into full climax. By the time the man that is called the Antichrist is here, what we're going to see is the climax, the culmination of evil. The mystery of iniquity is already at work on the earth. Only he that is restraining will restrain until he is taken out of the way. Then, verse 8, shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. And of course, part of the assignment of Jesus when he returns is to destroy that man, that Antichrist. Okay, verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. So there, it's called lying wonders. It's fake miracles. So they will, they will also add religion to the thing and corruption of religion. And not only fake miracles, but also the power of Satan working to produce visible signs. Just like Jennings and Jembris in trying to resist Moses, they also copied some of Moses' miracles. The magicians of Egypt. No, but it's not only lying signs and wonders that they would deploy. Look at verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness is about moral corruption. The erosion of moral values and virtues from the society. Making evil and sin the in thing, the popular thing. And everybody go for it. And that's why Christianity, authentic Christianity, will come under serious attack in those days. And even now it's happening. There is one factor with which you can know if a church is real. There is one factor with which you can know if a minister is real. If the subject of righteousness and moral values is in his ministry, in his mouth, in his teachings, and in how people live there. Of course, we're not saying you can get everybody to live right. Even in the midst of apostles, you will have Judas. Even in heaven, they had Satan there. So, we're not saying that. But watch. The Bible said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He gives three ways you know a real church where God is. Number one, he leads me to green pastures, which is where they teach the word of God with his integrity. Number two, he leads me to still waters, which is where you find the move of the Holy Spirit. The real one, oh. Number three, he leads me in the path of righteousness. If you don't find right, because Satan can fake miracles, but he can't fake virtues. You see, what he cannot fake is the nature of Christ. He can't, it's just not in him. So Jesus said it's by their fruit, you know them, not by their miracles, you know them. You see, God Almighty is very wise. Can I also say this? With reverence to the creator, Satan too is a very wise creature. 
He is nowhere near God. There is even no comparison. But don't think he's a fool. God Almighty is powerful. Satan too has power. They are diabolic power. There is a power of darkness. Let's not say it doesn't exist. God Almighty is the owner of heaven and earth. He's the owner of the universe. He is wealthy. Satan too has resources. He can't be compared to God, but he can make you offers that you can't, you, that is too, too hard to resist. So if Satan has some form of wisdom, even though it's diabolic wisdom, if Satan has some form of power, even though it's diabolic power, if Satan even has resources, look at what he offered Jesus. The kingdoms of this world and the glory of them. He said, it is delivered to me. I can give it to whosoever. And go and see people that have made deals with them, what he offers them. Where now is the distinguishing mark between him and the Almighty? If some of you see the devil, you will think he's Jesus. Because he doesn't appear wearing horns and black. He appears as an angel of light. So what is the distinguishing factor? The difference is that God is wise. God is powerful. God is rich and wealthy. He owns everything. He is all-knowing, he is all-powerful, he is all-wealthy, he is all-everything. But what differentiates him is that God is good. God is kind. God is merciful. It's his character that stands him out. So Christianity finds its foundation in moral values. It's a moral religion. If you remove righteousness, you have destroyed it. Because it finds its foundation in the nature of God. The person we are worshipping is the person we are called to be like. When he made us in the beginning, he made us in his image. After his likeness. And when we fell and lost all that, he sent Christ to remake us after his image again. What you call the new birth, recreation, regeneration, is the remaking, recreation of the human spirit to be in the image of Christ. And the image of Christ is the express image of the Father. Jesus is the express image of God Almighty. You and I are called to become again that image and to reflect it to our world. So you see, there is being before doing in Christianity. There is too much talk about the doing. That's why when we teach about the Holy Spirit, the only thing you hear about is anointing for miracles, anointing for healing. That's, not, that's the secondary job of the Holy Spirit. The main reason the Holy Spirit came is to give us the impartation of the divine nature. To make us like Jesus. To transform us from inside out. And that his inner work is what produces what is called the fruit of the spirit. If you fell in the moral and that area of subject of righteousness... And virtues and morality. You have lost the whole thing. And that's what the dece deception of the last days is all about. The deception of the last days is that once you confess Jesus as your Lord, once you are saved by grace, you can be doing the same evil that the unbelievers do, but it, it's not the same. You are going to heaven because the blood has. That's the greatest joke of the century. Is with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Please go back there. Second Thessalonians, we're in verse 2. Find back the verse where with all this is what is going all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. What is the problem here? People don't want to, they don't have love for truth, they won't want to hear the truth, they want to be able to do what they want to do, they are lawlessness because the last days the spirit of the age. I'm not talking about the spirit of God now that is the counter antidote. But the spirit of the age is the spirit of lawlessness. 
that they might be saved. So, verse 11. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Verse 12. If you don't love the truth, you are likely to end up with these guys. That they might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in what? What is this deception all about? There is an underlining key to it. Is that you can go on, do whatever sin you want, and still be right with God, and still go to heaven. You have to create your own heaven. Not the heaven of the Bible. And there are preachers now who are supplying this type of information. If somebody can produce the miraculous, but produces unrighteousness, stay away from such a person. That's the spirit of the age. This age that only follow miracles is in big trouble. You are to follow the truth. And the miracles confirm the truth. But if you leave the truth, and you see, you see, what is that distinguishing factor between God and Satan? It is not power. It's not money. This is how you know that you are my God because I made it. He just gave me a new car. That's not how you know that. Satan can produce that. Can give you the best, the one that is about to come out. This is how I know that you are my God. 10 million in my car. No, no, the devil can do that one. The distinction is when you get into their nature. You see, Jesus describing him, one, he said he was a liar from the beginning. When he speaks, there is no truth from him. Deception is his nature. Then he, another one, he says he's a murderer. All evil are the emanation of Satan's nature. And that's what he puts in people when they follow him. Be careful of religion the practice of religion, going to church, doing all that, when your life is not matching what you are doing. Being comes before doing. We are called to be like him. Then we are also called to do his works. So thank God for preaching, reaching out to the laws, and all of that. But the first calling is to be, to be. Romans chapter 8 said, he who he foreknew, he predestinated to be conformed. You can show it to them. To the image of his son. So that he will be the firstborn among many brethren. The greatest calling, desire of God for every believer is not that you, you are preaching. It's not that you are an apostle and all these titles. It's not that you are... Is that... You are conformed to Christ's image. Romans 8.29 is God's greatest desire for you. That you are like your father. You are like him. And that thing that undermines God's nature is what the whole concept of moral virtue is all about. So it's not just studying a set of do's and don'ts. It's studying who your father is. What he is like. And then the scripture said, imitate God as their children. That's why there are ministers that will go to hell. If you ask Jesus, he said, in Matthew 7, on that day, many will say to me, we did miracles in your name, we prophesied in your name, we did all that. Why will you, and they didn't do it in the name of the devil. Look at it, Matthew 7, 21. Not all who said to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that do it. Is the doing that is God's problem. Living out that life, the will of my Father, which is in heaven. The next verse. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have prophesied in your name. So you see all these things. In your name, I have cast out devils. In your name, done many wonderful works. But look at the next verse. Then I will profess to them, I never knew you. So the question is, what is the problem? Look at it. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. If you remove the moral component, your whole Christian experience collapses.
It doesn't matter what else you accomplish. Remove righteousness, remove godliness, everything is chaff. It's because of failure of believers in this area and failure of ministers to teach these things that now we have tongue-speaking and robbers. Born again prostitutes. Born again adulterers. Married women that even some unbelievers can't do. Are jumping around with men. Oh, some people that are not born again can't even try it. And this one is speaking in tongues and he's jumping around. We have 419 pastor. Some things that some unbelievers have enough ethics not to do. A person that is a man of the cloth is now doing No, they are not Christians, my friend. They have a form of godliness. Oh, oh, please go back to that my scripture in Timothy where he said having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. Let me show you what he means. Please go back there. Second Timothy chapter 3 verse 5. Let's look for amplified version. So you will see what power are they denying? Is it power to do miracle? No. Although they hold a form of piety or religion, but they deny and reject and are strangers to the power of it, their conduct belies the, the genuineness of their profession. They are, you see what the power, that power that changes people, that transforms people, it's not, hasn't done its work in their life. So their conduct sh sh shows the lack of genuineness of this, their profession. Avoid all such people. Turn away from them. Don't make them your friend. Of course, it, Believers that are like that because they will introduce corruption into your own life. Ministers that are like that, you can you can't be your friend. Oh, you cannot be my friend. We can meet in program exchange. You can't be my friend. If you are going to heaven. Befriend those that are heading in that direction. See, see, see this translation. New Living Translation. They act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. You see what we're talking about? The transforming power of the gospel. Stay away from such people. They go to church, you Put them in an office where there is money to develop hospital. They are still more than the unbeliever. So what is the issue now? What type of new Christianity do we now have? Where is the problem? I want us to review a little of that book. But, you know, even though in the priesthood summit, it's going to be one of the major focus of that whole thing. You know, but, but, but I just want to show you something. Pastor Nob, do you know what is behind 2 Timothy chapter 3, that prophecy about the last days? Difficult times shall come, perilous times, and see what we're going through in our own country. All those problems are caused by human beings who are kidnapping people, human beings, who are robbing people, human beings, who are fake pastors, human beings. Who are the ones doing 419? So some people wake up every week. They are looking for how to con other people out of the, their hard earned money. Who are the ones corrupting marriages, human beings? Now, what is it that is the underlying factor about these last days? Whatever. What we are having is a social and moral crisis in the society. It's not just Nigeria. It's a global issue. Is a predicted climate of the last days. And there is an antidote to it. And I'm going to come to that now. A social and moral crisis. Problems between people and people, between communities, in businesses, in the workplace. And all of this is about people, people, people problems everywhere. The moral problems.
Anointing, no character. Skill, no character. Power without ethics. I thought, I thought they call it polyethics. Politics. They've removed ethics from it. They just go for the power. 